morning. Glad you're here. Um, glad for this series that we're getting ready to go into. I hope you were here last week. If you were here last week, you enjoyed a message from Pastor Mike Meeks. And it was really, it's kind of, it's, it's an important message for Venice Church, for all the churches on our network, because it really defines kind of why we do things the way that we do things here at the church. So if you were not here, I encourage you to go online on our website and watch that message from last week. My wife and I took a little mini vacation last week, and we were up in Vegas. Don't judge. That's where our, that's where our grandkids live. It's the only reason we go there. Well, maybe not the only reason we go there. We're glad they live in Vegas and not Fresno. So, <laughs> so we were up there. I can say that. I was born in Fresno, so it's my right. <clears throat> We had a great time hanging out with the grandkids, and there was one little scene that I was thinking uh, will relate to this, this morning's message. So we were taking the kids to the swimming pool, there's a swimming pool in their neighborhood, and um, I was gone running an errand, I was going to come back and meet them at the pool, and so Mary Nell took the grandkids to the swimming pool, all four, uh, three of them. And I got back, and she told me one of the things that had happened with our youngest grandson, who's four years old. His name is Legend, and he lives up to his name. He is a legendary kid. So he has to go to the bathroom. He's in the pool. She tells me he has to go to the bathroom, and he got out of the pool to tell Mama that uh, I got to go to the bathroom, which is pretty impressive for a four-year-old to get out of the pool, right? I'm 52. I still stay in the pool when those things happen, you know? So anyways, he gets out of the pool. He says, well, i got to go to the bathroom. And so he, he, she says, well, okay, go. And I guess he, like, comes back, and he, he, he needed somebody to go with him. And so Landon, his older brother, takes him, and they go to the bathroom. And I don't remember the reason why, but they couldn't get into the bathroom, didn't get to the bathroom, or it was locked, or something happened. And she turns around and looks for him, see where he's at. And he's just, there's this little palm tree that are by the pools, and he's just at the little palm tree, just whipped his stuff out, and just doing his job right there at the palm tree, and it's crowded. There's a, like a lot of people, and he's four now, you know? It's like getting to an age where not doing that stuff. And so she yells at him, legend, and he ignores her, and then she goes, legend, and he turns around. <laughs> Pants drop down to the ankles, and he's just doing his business, and, and now he's facing everybody. <laughs> and, and then he doesn't just stop there. He starts... Just doing a little jig there, right there. Legend. He has not an uncomfortable bone in his body. There is no sense of shame. There is no sense of judgment. He just is who he is. I think we all need to pee a little bit more. I mean, be a little bit more like, I'm kidding. That was bad, huh? So how can that possibly relate to the subject of prayer? It doesn't really that well, other than I believe that God wants us to be so comfortable with him that there's not this, well, we're this, this way on these days or in these settings, and we're this way over on, on these times with these people, and we kind of morph into different persons, that we're just, we're there. This is who I am. This is where I'm at. This is who I am. And God wants us to be that way in prayer, in prayer to be ourselves. I don't know if you know this, but all of you were wired for prayer. We are all wired for prayer. We are created by our creator with a design and a desire to seek him and to connect with him in prayer. That's what makes, that's what makes us human. Dogs don't pray. Cats do not pray to God. Cats think they are God. <laughs> Those of you who have cats. Animals are not, I know you love animals, I love animals, but animals are not created in the image of God. Mankind is. And we have it in our DNA. We're, it's wired into us, this desire to reach for our creator and to connect with him. And the way that we do connect with him is in prayer. But even though we're wired that way, and it's kind of ridiculous to even argue that, we are wired that way to seek something out um, when it comes to prayer, many people feel very inadequate and uncomfortable. 
and not comfortable praying out loud or, 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 or in front of other people. In fact, if I did that today, if I called one of you right now just spontaneously and I said, hey, why don't you come on up here and lead us in prayer this morning? You might pee your pants right there. You might bolt for the door. You might pass out. You might do anything because of just the, the oh my gosh, right? We're just scared to do that. So what we want to do in this whole series, we're going to do 40 days of prayer. It's our summer series. And what we want to do is demystify this thing. Demystify it. What, what is prayer really all about? Here, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He, God, has planted eternity in us. It's wired into us to reach out to him. So it's important to understand this. Prayer is not the end game. Prayer is not the goal. It's not like I want to learn how to sound really good and spiritual in prayer. You know, have you ever felt that? Like you listen to somebody else pray and you were like, oh, if I could only pray like that, then I would pray out loud. You know, it's the goal is not prayer. The goal is what prayer accomplishes. It's a means to an end. Go ahead and write this down. This is our series, Big Idea. We pray so that we can be connected to God and his power. <clears throat> That's the, the end goal of prayer. Not that we pray more eloquently or anything like that, but that we could be connected to God, his life, his power. So I want you to think of prayer in a very simplistic way, kind of like a plug at a lamp. The plug is not the point. The plug is the plug. The lamp is the point. Well, the plug's job is to plug into the power source that can get that power in order to illuminate the lamp, turn it on. And that's exactly, in a crude way, that's what prayer is. Prayer is that means that we connect to God with so that his power, his life, can flow through us and come to us. So each week, we're going to look at a different prayer from the Apostle Paul that he wrote. He's the guy who wrote most of the New Testament. We're going to look at a different prayer. And we're going to kind of examine it and then talk ourselves through it. So this first one is one of my favorite prayers in Scripture. He's praying for a young church in Ephesus, and this is what he prays. You can follow along in your outline or on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1 says, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. His prayer continues. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand, <clears throat> pardon me, the confident hope he has given to those he called. His holy people a rich in glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand <clears throat> the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So I think we all want what he was praying for for that early church. That we want to grow in wisdom, we want to grow in hope, be confident in hope, have God's great power resting in our lives. How many of you would agree that that would be a good result to have happen in your lives at the end of this 40 days of prayer, right? We grow that way. We want that. So as we begin this, this journey I first want to take a few minutes and kind of debunk some of the myths about prayer. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about what prayer is not, okay? So first, you can write this down. Prayer is not a magic wand. It's not like this thing that we say, and we got like Harry Potter's wand, and we say it just right in a certain way, that all of a sudden things that we want to happen, happen, that it gets fixed or, or whatever else. It's, it, it's not a magic wand. Wand. When I, for, when I was young in the Lord, I was in Bible college, I just started, and I had only been a couple years into this whole Jesus thing, but I was, I was on fire, I, I, I love the Lord, it's excited, and, uh, but I was, I was still a, quite a work in progress. I'm no longer a work in progress, by the way, I have arrived. <laughs> so there's a friend of mine, uh, Donnie, and he was in school with me. He's a pastor now up in the Sacramento area. And whenever we get together with friends or our wives or whatever, he always feels like he has to tell this one story of young Mark. Uh, we, were, we were down uh, the 99 somewhere, down, I think, Modesto or something like that for some event that we had, and we're on the way back. And I'm the only one who had a car at that time. It was an old Ford Granada. Yeah! And uh, so we're coming back, 
and we get, you know, I think we just passed Lodi or something like that, a little ways out, and all of a sudden, I'm running out of gas. And, it, and, and then I know the next gas station is going to be still like another five miles away. And so I'm like, okay, all right, we can fix this. Donnie, I got this. Father God, fill the tank now. Lord, fill the tank. I'm serious, too. With no exaggeration, I was very sincere. I'm like, Father. And then it starts to die a little bit more, and I'm like, Father! <laughs> and Donnie says, I think Father would have preferred you put gas back in Modesto, is what he's saying. I thought of God that way a little bit. Like, make it work. Fill the tank. <laughs> he's not a magic wand. Prayer is not a magic wand. Here's another thing prayer is not. Prayer is not a fire extinguisher. If you see a fire extinguisher on a wall in a box case, there's usually an accompanying sign that it is attached to it that says, break glass only in case of emergency. Only in the case of emergency. This represents those who pray when there's an emergency, when there's, they only pray, when there's a fire to put out. And it's a good thing to pray when there's a fire, when there's an emergency, but we don't want that to be typically the only time we do. But for many of us, it is the only time. Why don't you check this it's out? It's already on sale. They're, what? They're not supposed to be available yet. I don't know what to tell you, but they're on sale. Wait, wait, are you sure they're Star Wars tickets? No, it's Steel Magnolias 2, even steelier. <laughs> The website's frozen, I can't get in. Yeah, Same too. here. Guys, they're gonna sell out. What are we gonna do? All right, this goes against everything I stand for, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Lord. <laughs> this is Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> You're good friends with my mom. <laughs> That's funny, That's so true, right? <laughs> Uh, prayer, and when, again, when things do go bad, we do want to pray. We have a God that wants to be involved in that, but we don't want prayer to be the last resort. We want it to be the first choice that, that we make, not, not the, the thing that we do after we've exhausted everything else. You know, well, we might as well pray. Uh, it's come to that. Wow. I, I remember a time I was asked, I was called on the phone. Um, it, was, they were kind of, it felt like an emergency. They said, hey, Pastor Mark, we really need you to come to our house to talk to us. And so I said, sure. And when I got over there, I drove up, and I remember looking at the house from the outside, and, I, and just honest, it was just a mess. It was just overgrown. It was trash. It just looked really bad. And then I got inside, and the, and the yard was nice. It was, it was, it was in heaps and um, just unkept. And, but whatever, I, I sat down and talked to them and said, okay, what, what's going on? And they, had, they shared. And man, it was just a laundry list of brokenness. Their daughter had just ran away, couldn't find her anywhere. Um, he had lost his job. The husband had lost his job a couple weeks uh, or a couple months earlier, and they had been unemployed. So financially, they were just devastated. And they both were at a point where considering divorce, you know, we're just toast can't do this. They were both in depression, which explained why they, they felt like they didn't even have the energy to keep up the house or anything. They were, they were at that point, and then the, the, the dad said this, I don't know, maybe we should pray. And I went, you think? Maybe. I didn't say that, but in my brain, I'm like, yes, but not, not, not just as a last resort, not when it's after every, you're at the at divorce court, and then you realize Gosh, maybe we should pray about this. Prayer is not a last resort. Prayer is something that we want to be so much of a staple of our lives that it's just, it's not this event that we go to and do when we need to use a fire extinguisher and put something out that's bad. It's something that's so part of the tapestry of our lives that we just naturally would, would lock, lock into that and pray in the very beginning as well. So it's not a fire extinguisher. Here's another one. Prayer is not a tug of war. You can write that down. It's not a tug of war um, that we kind of like God's on one side of the rope. Did you ever play tug of war as a kid? God's on one side of the rope and you're over here with your prayer request and you are trying to just talk him into coming over to your side. And for some reason you see him as resisting and you have to kind of beg or plead with God. It's, it's not a tug of war. We don't, have to, we don't have to beg him. It's not a please God, you know, please see how important this is. It, it's, it's, it's not that. It's not about a, a bargain, or a barter. How many of you have done that? I've done that with God, where it's like, Lord, if you do this, right, 
I promise. How many of you have made those to the Lord? If you, God, if you get me out of this jam, or Lord, if you do this, then, oh gosh, I remember this, this just came to me. I remember watching a, a video on YouTube of two guys who stole a car, and they are in a stolen car being chased, and the cop comes up behind them. There's a camera in the car that they stole filming them, and a cop flashes on his lights behind them, and, and is pulling them over, and the, well, the driver says, come on, pray, pray. I'm like, <laughs> you should have had prayer as a part of your life before. It's not God. It's not bartering this, and then, you know, you tell God, and I will, as though God is saying, oh my gosh, that's a deal. I'm going to take him up on that. It's not bartering with God. Here's the last conception or misconception. Prayer is not a ritual to relieve guilt. Now, I know that many of you grew up with this as probably a major reason to pray, that if you sinned, and if your sin was really big, then you would say a prayer enough times, and that somehow would absolve from you from what you did. And it would relieve guilt that you wouldn't have to carry along. And that may, look, I'm not slamming anybody or anything, but I'm, I'm going to tell you emphatically and unequivocally, that is not in the scripture anywhere. It's, it's just not anywhere in the scripture. In fact, quite the opposite is in the scripture. It's a tradition of men, but it's not something that God instituted for us to relieve guilt and to get this out. Prayer is not a penance. Prayer is a joy. It's an invitation into this relationship with God. In fact, let's look at that. Let's look at not just what prayer is not. Let's look at a couple of foundational things of what prayer really is. It's going to help us navigate through this entire series. So number one, write this down. Prayer is a relationship. It is not a ritual. When you have somebody that you're in a relationship with and you love them, then you want to spend time with them. You want to talk with them. We know this. You want to share experiences with them and, and life with them. I, this last week, I uh, got up at a... Uh, I always rise early. I'm an early riser. I get up early, but it was, it was a dreadful hour I got up at, uh, very early. And so, and I was just, I couldn't get back to sleep, so I got up. And being the spiritual giant that I am, I went on Amazon and looked for a movie to watch. <laughs> so I found one that I'd wanted, been wanting to watch, and it was called I Can Only Imagine. I don't know if you've seen that yet. It's the true story of the lead singer from Mercy Me, a Christian group. And it was outstanding. It was outstanding. I just loved this movie. I loved the actors. I loved, I loved that song. How many of you remember that song? Just so impactful. And so I watched this thing, and I'm by myself, and I'm bawling watching this thing, and then, but all the while I'm watching, I'm thinking, oh, Mary Nell would love this. Oh, oh my gosh, Mary Nell would love this. Mary Nell would love this. And so I, I know sooner, I finish it, and I'm like, I can't even wait. I don't care if she's awake or not. So I go and I get Mary Nell, I say, babe, you've got to watch this with me right now. And so it's the only movie, I think, in my whole life that I've watched, like, Back to back, just watched it again. But the reason I wanted to watch it again is because I wanted to share it with one I love. I wanted to share it with her. I wanted to see her experience. That's kind of what you do when, with relationships, and that is what God is like. He's interested in us. He's interested in you. He really is. He's fascinated with you, and he's inter you are his creation. And you say, well, why is he interested in me? Well, he created you, one. He loves you. He's interested in the things that you are interested in. And you, you don't, don't even argue that because, look, he designs us. So the, the peculiarities about who you are, those things that you're really interested in, he put those interests in you for music and for art and things that make you go. And he wants to be a part of that, exploring that, talking about that. It's not too trivial for him. It's a relationship. And so it's not contractual. I don't just engage with Mary Nell when there's business to be talked about or with my kids or with you or anything. Relationships are built on that, those areas of interest. And God wants to be a part of That's part of what prayer is. It just builds that relationship. While Mary Nell was at the pool with the 
little ones, I had the oldest of the grandkids. He's 12 years old, Keale. And we were headed off to Target to get some toys that we could play with in the pool. And we were there driving in the car. I'm asking him, you know, hey, so how's school going? All those, like, grandpa questions, right? How's school going? Oh, it's going good. Yeah, going good. Well, what, how's your friends? Hey, you got some good friends? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got some. He's such a nice kid. But I could tell it was, like, you know, boring grandpa type questions, you know. Uh, how are your grades? No, I didn't go that far. But then I knew, I knew, I said, I said, hey, dude, so what's with your YouTube channel, the, 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 the gaming thing that you've got going on there? He's like, Fortnite? Which I'd never heard of, but apparently it's like the biggest thing there is right now. And so I go, yeah, Fortnite, I'm crazy about that. What's up there? What's going on? And then I couldn't shut him up for the whole half an hour as he's telling me about everything and his builds and the levels that he's gotten to and he's competing and he's got followers with him and subscribers and he's doing this. And it was, it was great because I, and he could see that I was genuinely interested and I really was because I'm fascinated by those things because I can't do them at all. And so we're talking and having this new level and I really, that's, that's how God is with us. That's really what prayer is all about. Even at its core, we're going to talk a lot of things about prayer. I've even got a couple more points this morning. But this first one, that's it. It's about relationship. It's not about a ritual. This morning when I got up, I talked to God. And it wasn't just, okay, Lord, I just pray for today's service. I pray that you would do it. It's not that. It's just taking a walk and talking and talking about things that are going on in my life, things that are going on, and having that relationship. That's what he's jealous for. He's interested in you. He wants that with you, and that's really what it's all about. Here's another one, though. Prayer is a conversation. It's not a ceremony. You don't need to go to a certain place or have special candles or be dressed a certain way or use certain words in the right way in order to pray. It's not a ceremony. It doesn't have to be just done just right or it doesn't work. There's, there's nothing about it like that. You should pray. Hear me on this. You should pray the way you talk. You should pray the way you talk. So it's not like, okay, I'm getting ready to talk to God. Now I've got to morph into the King James or Old English and do that. It's pray the way you talk to God. I will never forget a time I, we were in uh, back in Bible college, again, all these first experiences happened back then. And we had this friend, and he's a great dude. He was a fun dude. We hung out. We went over to his house one night, some other friends of mine. We went over to his house one night. And I don't remember the occasion of why, but for some reason, we decided we needed to pray about something. Don't even remember what it was. So he, he leads out. And I kid you not, he's talking to us, you know, do this, this, that. And then and he goes, guys, let's pray. And then we'll bow our heads, and he goes... As the dew settles upon the morning meadow, we pray that your radiance would settle upon the meadow of our hearts. And about when he got there, I was like, what? I opened my eyes. I looked at my friend who was dying laughing over here in the corner over here because we're like, dude, who are you? You, you don't talk that way. <laughs> I just... It's true. You, look, be you with God. Don't morph into, oh, benevolent Father, we beseech thee today. On to-. Just talk to God. Talk to, as you talk, talk to God. Unless you got a real potty mouth, you might want to clean that up before you talk to God. I remember a dude who, when he first is no joke, he's, he was new to the Lord. We, we were in a prayer meeting. He was in a prayer meeting actually with my friends. And they told me, so they, they, they wanted to do spiritual warfare and prayer, so he started cussing out the devil. You mother of, he started just right into prayer meeting, just cussing out the devil out loud. I'm going to kick you. And I'm, I'm like, <laughs> it was so funny because it, it was raw. He had some growing to do, but, you know, at least he wasn't being religious. That would have been even worse. Listen, here's the passage. Here's the passage right here. Matthew chapter 6. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. They got it. They got the fame and the accolades from people. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
Now, pause right there for a second, because we're going to be talking about later on in the series, there is appropriate times to pray out loud and with other people. But the primary reason for our prayer life is relationship. So I say, make it a personal thing. Make it an intimate thing. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on and on like pagans, people who don't know God, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you're asking. You can hear God through Jesus here pleading with him, saying, hey, keep, keep it simple. Keep it short. Keep it simple. Just pray and talk to me. In fact, Jesus talked about the kinds of prayers that God listens to, who he is. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 13, says, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And we talked about that word, uh, proskineo, a couple of weeks ago, which means to revere, it's a, to re revere and fear him and to worship him. And he's saying, I'm a father. I'm compassionate. Matthew 7, 11 said, he said, look, if you sinful people, meaning all of us, right? We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So you imperfect people, which we all qualify for that, know how to give good gifts to your children, and you're imperfect. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus is saying that God listens to that sincere, simple prayer. Do not try to wax eloquent. Do not try to become good at sounding good in prayer. When I'm praying with people, and all of a sudden maybe there's somebody who's like, they pause because they don't know what to say, and then this, and then they stumble over this. I'm like, that's cool because it's, you're being sincere. You know, you're talking to God, and, and, and that's okay. It doesn't have to be. It's certainly not for show. And so we want to keep it simple. We want to keep it sincere. And here's another thing, and you can write this. It's not in your outline, but you can write it off to the side. When we come to prayer, we want to talk, but we want to also listen. We want to listen. We want to be able to hear God speak to us. And, and that doesn't mean audibly. If people are telling you they're hearing God audibly, I would suggest you get new friends from that. It's, it's, I've, I've never heard God audibly speak. Maybe some people have. I don't know. I know Moses did. Um, but I never have. But he still speaks to us. Um, I remember this girl that I, was, I wanted to date really bad in Bible college. I had a lot of experiences in Bible college, I'm realizing this morning. And I wanted to date her. No other reason. She was just fine. And I wanted to date her. And so, uh, I, and she's in a Bible college. So I figured that's a good, you know, it's a good place to start. It's got to be legit. And so, we go out on our first date, and I remember I was talking to her, and I shared something about, like, this job opportunity that I had, and I was just praying about whether I should take it or not, and just asking God for wisdom and stuff like that, and I think I asked her, yeah, pray for me on that, and we stopped by, I think it was a 7-Eleven or an AM, PM, and I ran in for whatever, a pack of gum or a, a, a soda or something like that, and I get back out to the car, shut the door, and she says, Father says it's okay, take the job. And I went, okay, <laughs> father told you that about me, did he? I'm like, in my brain, I was like, I'm glad this manifested on the first date. And I didn't have to go through, you know, paying for meals and stuff like that before craziness showed itself. <laughs> that relationship obviously did not work out. Uh, but I'm talking about the impressions that God gives you. He said, my sheep will hear my voice. I'm addicted to that. I don't, I can't, I don't want to live without that. And that's not something that's just super spiritual. Oh, you hear from God? I think many of you do and maybe don't realize it. But how he speaks to us through his word as we're praying and that still small voice that we hear, that's the relationship. I'm way more interested, to be honest, and we'll talk about this more in the week's head, but I'm way more interested in what he has to say than what I have to say. And so I want to take some time and quiet myself and have that conversation, that relationship, be both give and take of talking as well as listening. During these 40 days of prayer, we're going to learn a lot about that. What does it mean to really hear from the Lord? Here's, here's um, the last one as we close up today. Prayer is an opportunity. It is not an obligation. Listen, I'm sorry, but if you see prayer as a duty in your life and as an obligation... Um, then your, your prayer life is sunk. I, I know that. 
It's an invitation and an opportunity to engage with the king of glory in relationship that he invites us into wherever we're at in that. Whether you're brand new, whether you don't even know him, to begin that and to begin to talk to him. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Prayer is an invitation for all of us to come and to be with him. Truth is, you don't have to pray. You can write out where your level is right now. You don't have to pray. But he is inviting us to say, come on, let's do this together. I want to do life with you. That's why he said, I created you for my pleasure. We were created for his pleasure. And so I don't want this walk with God to be something for the rest of my life that all I'm trying to do, the, the earnestness of it is just trying to do better and just trying to behave better. And, and man, you know, see people, bless people. What, I want to walk with him. And he wants you to walk with him. The disciples, his, his best friends, these men who walked with him for three years and they watched what he did. You've got to imagine that. They watched him heal a man with blind eyes or cleanse a leper or a paralytic get up. They watched this power. They watched him teach in such ways that captivated thousands of people with, with authority and yet such compassion. They watched how he handled people. They watched him do all these things and never once did they say, hey, teach us how to do that blind eye thing. Or can you teach us how to speak? You know, so we can captivate people or any of that. They said they knew where it all came from. They said, teach us how to pray. They knew that that's where he got his juice from. That's where he got his power from. That's where he got his connection from. And they knew if they knew how to do that part, the rest would come. Teach us how to pray. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go on this journey together through this summer. Not the whole summer, but about four weeks. And we're going to go on it and we're going to look at, Lord, bring us deeper. It's an invitation. It's an opportunity to see our lives grow in that way, which changes everything in our lives for it. And I hope you'll look back on the summer of 18 and go, that was the time my prayer life really took off and I began to experience some true transformation in my life or in my family. I just want to close with this verse. It's James chapter 4, verse 8. It says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Not maybe, not perhaps, no tug of war. Come close to God. God will come close to you. Come close. How do we do that? A big part of that is through prayer, engaging, talking, and communicating with him. So let's do this together and, uh, and see what God has in store for us. Would you pray with me right now? God, we're grateful. Grateful that you, you created us to be in relationship with you. you. You've called it. That's your main point. And you've allowed us to not have some relationship that's just a commitment of doing better or trying harder, but a relationship of conversation, of interaction, of engagement. And so we say thank you for that. And yet, Lord, it's, it's, doesn't, it, it's, it's uncomfortable for so many of us. We've not seen that modeled. And so I pray that you would help us all, even through this summer, to take some giant leaps in that. Open our hearts and our, and our minds to comprehend this, even the excitement you have for us to know you at a greater level and to share our lives with you. We we'll pray that happens here for folks here this year, this summer, at this church, for your glory. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.